Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and you are watching The Digital Age. With us tonight is Shannon O'Neill. Shannon O'Neill is a senior fellow for Latin American Affairs at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's also a blogger. She blogs for latinintelligence.com. Lately, her focus has been on Mexico, and she's written a brilliant new book entitled Two Nations Indivisible, Mexico, the United States, and the Road Ahead, in which she examines the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Shannon, I'm delighted to welcome you back to the program. Great to be here. Now, let me, I'm always intrigued with titles, <laughs> and congratulations on your book, Thank which you. I couldn't put down. And uh, it talks about the road ahead. What is the road ahead for the two countries? If we look at the relationship over the last few decades, it's deepened in many, many ways. It's deepened economically, as so much more of what the United States makes is in conjunction with Mexico. It's deepened through people, through immigration and the back and forth of Mexicans to the United States, but also many Americans to Mexico. And so as we think about how our nations are going to grow in the future, the things that we care about, how are we going to export our way into prosperity again, or the things that we've talked about in the United States, Mexico is going to be a vital part of it. So the road ahead for the United States, the good road ahead, but also the challenges that we have ahead will involve Mexico in many different ways. Well, you argue that Mexico has made tremendous progress over the last three mm -hmm. decades. Uh, politically, three decades ago it was an authoritarian regime, mm -hmm. isn't that right? It was. Dominated by one political party. Mm -hmm. The uh, PRI. The PRI, Mexico, P -R -I. Right. The PRI, exactly. Uh, and uh, describe briefly what, what has happened to it, in, uh, to Mexico in 30 years politically. Well, politically, we saw, if you look back in the 1980s and the 1990s, there was one party, as you mentioned, the PRI. And it controlled almost all aspects of government, all levels, national, f uh, state, and local. But it also controlled the huge bureaucracy, and it used patronage to keep this coalition together. What we saw over the last particularly 20 years is a real opening up, a slow democratization. And today, Mexico boasts three competitive political parties. Almost everyone says it has free and fair elections. And we see real competition uh, that has brought voters really into the mix in Mexico. So while there's still problems in Mexico, there's areas that are opaque, less than transparent. There's areas where people worry about. And some in Mexico, in this last election last year, we saw the pre-return uh, back. And many worry that perhaps we go back to the old authoritarian past. But you look at Mexico's institutions, its executive branch, its legislative branch, even increasingly its judicial branch, it is a democracy that's here to stay. And let's talk about economics because mm -hmm. at the heart of everything seems to be economics. So go back 30 years ago, uh, what was the position then? It was dominated by oil, was it not? Right, the economy was dominated by oil and also by state-owned enterprises. So Mexico had hundreds and hundreds of enterprises owned by the, by the government there. Uh, and it also had very high tariffs, subsidies, quotas, and others. So it was a very closed economy to the United States and to the world in general. And what we've seen over the last 20 plus years is a fundamental transformation. So Mexico is now one of the most open economies in the world. It has free trade agreements with over 40 nations. And it is also one that is quite competitive globally. So you look at measures of openness, things like trade to GDP, and Mexico is much larger than the United States or a place like Brazil, but it's even bigger than a place like China. So this is a very open economy, and it's no longer dominated by oil. It's in fact, those exports today are dominated by manufactured goods. So it's a fundamentally different place economically than it was, say, in the 1980s. Now, have Mexico's economic gains uh, and its uh, growth uh, meant uh, greater per capita income for its people? We have seen an increase in per capita income. It's been slower than many would like and, and that Mexico needs to have. So there's been a big challenge in how do you increase the livelihoods, not just of a few, but of the many. I mean, one thing you have seen over the last 15 years is the rise of a middle class. And by most measures, a slight majority today are considered middle class. So they have some disposable income, they're able to go out and buy cars, they're able to buy cell phones, they're able to buy their houses. So there has been a fundamental change, but this is the challenge for Mexico. How do you keep moving up the socioeconomic scale? And how do you bring this to the still tens of millions who are poor? 
Now, Mexico has a new president. Its presidents are elected for six years. Mm -hmm. uh, With no re-election. No re-election <laughs> uh, on uh, probably a good system, but it's just <laughs> uh, on And his name is Enrique uh, Pina Nieto. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, no sooner did he come into office than he decided to take on the, uh, the monopoly, duopoly in the telecom industry. Mm -hmm. Tell about that. Well, it's interesting. He had a lot of promises during the campaign, and many thought these were just campaign promises. But since he's come in just a few months ago, he has gone after some vested interests. And the most recent and, and most um, uh, in the press, sort of people looking at, is telecommunications, which in Mexico is dominated by one man, um, Carlos Slim, who Forbes has for four years running uh, announced as the richest man in the world here. So what- That's more than Putin. M more than Putin, more <laughs> than Gates, more than, more than all the others, at, le at least for right now. Um, but this reform, which has passed the House, is waiting passage in the Senate, but looks like it will pass there, uh, does take on those monopolies. It will take on the fixed landline, which he has, Telmex, as well as his control over cell phones, which right now is over 70%. So this should fundamentally change at least part of the economy, um, which has also held Mexico back in the sense of bringing better well-being for all. Now, uh, this bill, uh, the regulatory bill, is backed by all three parties, isn't that right? It is. What's interesting, when the new president came in in the beginning of December, the first thing he announced was a pact for Mexico. So during the transition period, he had negotiated with the other two parties. The PAN, which had just left office, was the previous uh, holding the executive branch there, the presidency, and the PRD, which is the left side, uh, and negotiated with some of the party leaders there. So they set out a pact for Mexico that covered some 90 things, things that needed to change in Mexico. So one was telecommunications and media, Another was the education system. They've also put on their fiscal reform, tax reform, as well as changing the energy sector. There's lots of things in there about how to make Mexico better. Uh, and they've started to chip away at those things. So we saw an education reform pass quickly, and now on the docket is this telecommunications and media reform. Now the PAN, that was uh, Vincente Fox's party, isn't that right? It was his party and, and President Calderon right and before. And President Calderon right before, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Fox was uh, really the first uh, member of PAN ever to achieve the presidency mm -hmm. since the Mexican Revolution. Exactly, it? well for uh, 70 years the PRI controlled the presidency and Vicente Fox was the first to to come from an opposition party. Now, is the PAN, let's see if I can understand it, is the PAN more conservative than the PRI? The PAN is more conservative. If, I mean, the, the ideological spectrum is, is blurred in Mexico, and the PRI, in many ways, is an umbrella that covers from the right all the way to the left. So you have you know, neoliberal, open market technocrats within the PRI, as well as nationalists, uh, progressive elements as well. So it's quite umbrella party. But if you look at the spectrum, the PAN falls more on a free market right, um, also on, on parts of the PAN on social issues, abortion and, and the church and otherwise are quite conservative. So it comes on that side. The PRD is the opposite, more progressive on the left, more open to, to gay marriage and things like that. And the PRI is, uh, sort of straddles the fence. This PRI straddles the fence. So it's right down the middle. It takes that middle space, but it also has elements and leaders that, that creep into both the left and the right. Now, the number one issue that comes to mind when anyone mentions Mexico is security. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, a poll was taken, and they asked Americans uh, uh, to come up with three words that describe Mexico. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what those were? I do. So I was an advisor on this poll, and it was interesting. One out of every two Americans said drugs, the word drugs. And then many other runners up were things like corruption, cartels, gangs, violence. So the U.S. perceptions, broad perceptions of Mexico are quite negative and quite focused on security. Now, are these unfair perceptions when uh, 50,000 people have been killed in drug violence in the last five years? You know, security is a huge issue for Mexico, and it's not that it's not real, it's incredibly real. And I would say it's the fundamental challenge for that nation. How do you control organized crime and the serious spikes in violence we've seen over the last five or six years? But it's not the only story in Mexico. And that, in my book, Two Nations Indivisible, I focus on some of these other stories, some of these other total transformations we've seen, many of them positive. It doesn't mean that the security situation isn't real and incredibly difficult and incredibly important, but it's not the only story for our neighbor. Now, uh, President Calderon uh, decided when he took office he was gonna take on the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. 
2006, and he brought out the army to take on the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. And what happened? He did. He brought out the army. He started in his home state of Michoacan. He showed up there with, with uh, a couple battalions or a couple, a couple units. Um, and it started off well. It brought back some of the territory. It made people feel safer in the streets. And in fact, looking at Mexican public opinion polls, the way people rate the army, it's one of the most trusted institutions in Mexico. And many people wanted the army brought in because they felt that local police, state police, weren't able to protect them. But armies aren't trained to be local police. Uh, and some of the powers they have or they don't have made it difficult for them to, say, capture criminals and send them into the justice system in Mexico, which has its own set of problems. So the issue in Mexico, the army's still, <coughs> still out in the streets. Um, but the question is, what do we do now? How does Mexico really deal with their organized crime problem? And, and as you know, in your, in your other parts of your life and in working in the justice system in various uh, situations or various roles, that's the real challenge for Mexico. How do you fix your court system so that they can you know, prosecute and convict the guilty, but also free the innocent? Well, was uh, Calderon successful uh, when uh, he took on the drug cartels? Or didn't he uh, simply atomize them and uh, drive them out, out to Colombia, as mm -hmm. I've heard, and uh, they were replaced by gangs, uh, armed kids well, with the, AK-47, right. <laughs> which they <laughs> found <laughs> got from America. <laughs> I think the challenge for Mexico is bringing out the army did in some places slow the violence and brought some security back to some streets. But the issue is, one, there aren't enough soldiers in Mexico to cover the whole nation and, and provide the security. Uh, and two, the army isn't really designed to do what you need to do. If you want to establish a democratic rule of law, the army is not going to be your long-term vehicle. What you need are professional police forces and court systems that work. And those are the two aspects in Mexico that have yet to be reformed. And what's interesting, when we started, we start, started talking about democracy and democratization, Democracy brings quick changes to the executive branch, the presidency, and the legislative branch. Elections, competitive elections, clear things out and change the dynamics there. But they don't change the dynamics of the judicial branch, and they, and they shouldn't, right? The fact that you have a different party in power shouldn't change the judicial branch. And that part of the Mexican political system had been eroded under 70 years of authoritarian rule. It had never been used for, you know, the, the arbitration of, of good and bad for, for convicting the, the guilty and freeing the innocent. It had been used as a political tool. So as the Pan governments came in or, or others came in, their challenge is how do you create a real justice system that works? And so that is something both Pan presidents, Fox and Calderon, have been working towards slowly and that this government really has on its plate. And that would include both an independent judiciary, but also mm -hmm. uh, a uh, professional uh, office of public prosecutions that uh, mm -hmm. did a very thorough job. I understand that uh, prosecutors in Mexico uh, look for uh, a plea mm -hmm. and, uh, or look for admissions, and if they can't find a, a confession or a plea, they just don't investigate a case any further. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the, the statistics are very sobering in Mexico. Many cases are just never reported to the police. Uh, and then those that are investigated are, are quite low in number. And so in the end, you get only about a 2% conviction rate on, on crimes. And, and the more difficult or heinous the crime, so murder or these others, are prosecuted and convicted much less than petty theft. Those are the people that often get in sort of caught stealing something, often worth less than $20. Those are the people in jail, not the organized crime ringleaders. So and that's the challenge. And what's the lure of gangs? I mean, the gang is into the drug trade now? Some are in the drug trade. Um, some are brought into the various you know, organized crime syndicates that bring drugs into the United States, the largest consumer market in the world. Uh, some are, are local gangs, and you, you know, think back to the United States, to Los Angeles or, or New York, say, back 20, 30 years ago, and, and we had this problem of gangs, right? And, and often it's disaffected youth who, who don't see a long-term future for themselves. There, there's a saying in Mexico that you'd rather live five years as a king than, than 50 years as, as an ox or sort of a day laborer. And, and so what Mexico needs to do is change that calculation for kids that grow up on the margins have them see a path forward that, that moves beyond just a couple years, that they see themselves succeeding in life uh, through, through other channels. 
Now, uh, the uh, law enforcement effort uh, has been somewhat disappointing. I mean, just the other day in Ms. State, mm -hmm. which you referred to, uh, uh, seven bodies were found uh, strapped to plastic chairs on the main drag of the, of the town. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that was where uh, Calderon came from. Exactly. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, you feel as if the, there's still uh, room for um, uh, an ability to progress? This is Mexico's big challenge. We saw Calderon bring the issue to the center of the policy realm, make it his signature issue. He started professionalizing at least the federal police, and he also passed a constitutional reform to transform the court system, which is supposed to come online in three years. Um, but that's not done. Um, and the police forces, while the federal police force is better than it was, the state and local forces, which are the vast majority of police officers, have not been changed or not changed in many places. So these are the two issues. If Peña Nieto wants to ensure security, when he finishes his term, if he wants to see a safer Mexico, he has to take these two issues on. Uh, do you believe Mexico has become a failed state? That I don't believe. That was a, a, a theory or, or many articles and, and even the U.S. government talked a lot about a few years ago. And it's not a failed state. We're not talking about Ethiopia or, or many other places, say, in the Middle East or in Africa. This is a place that holds free and fair elections, collects taxes, builds roads, runs schools. This is a place that is a strong, actually many places, a very strong government. But there are areas of Mexico that it's not strong. There well, are areas that are, we see an absence of the government and of security. What can the United States do to help Mexico? You know, we started working with Mexico in terms of security assistance back under the Bush administration. And it was the first time actually we'd worked in a serious way with Mexico. And what we can do is continue that, but we can evolve what we do. In that time, we did a lot more about hardware. We worked with the military. We sent them planes and helicopters and other types of equipment. Today, what Mexico really needs is this changing and reforming of its institutions. So for instance, as they try to or work to implement their justice reform, we can help them prepare the system. So they need to build courtrooms because they're moving from a written system to an oral trial system. We can help train lawyers and judges and, and uh, also police officers to collect evidence to work within a new system that has much stronger due process, um, but also has much higher bars um, for evidence. I and mean, this is all things that the Mexican system has not yet developed, um, even changing law school curriculums. There's lots of things that, that we do here that we could help them, either our own uh, officials or people experts, but also bringing together people from all over the world and from Latin America to work with Mexicans. Now a real barrier between us is immigration reform, is it not? It is an issue for both countries. For both countries. Yeah. Now why don't you talk about that a little bit? What kind of reform would you like to see? Uh, what do we need yeah. to do? Well as we think about not just Mexico, but we think about immigration reform in general, almost everyone agrees that our system is broken and isn't working for us. It's not working for our economy because uh, it's not flexible bringing in the types of people that would be useful for our economy now in a you know, more fragile economy, but particularly if we're going to grow. Um, and it's not working for the many families that are here as well. And one aspect of immigration, and particularly Mexicans, but others as well, is how many mixed families we have where one parent is legal or is a U.S. citizen and one is not or two or three kids are legal, but two or three are not. And so think about your family. Would you, even if you lost your job, even if it was hard to work here, would you leave the country thinking you'd never see your spouse again or never see your kids or your siblings again? You're not gonna see those people self-deport, which has often been a, a mantra of those who, who wanna see tougher rules. They're here because of family ties, not just work ties. So how do you make it easier for them to stay together uh, and then be productive parts of our society. That's a big issue, and then it affects Mexico. So how do you do that? Path to citizenship? I think you have a path to citizenship. I think you make it What should the easier. criteria be? You know, I think the criteria should be that you pay fines, that you have ties here, that you show that you can be a good citizen. It doesn't have to be quick, um, but it does show an ability for you to stay and become a productive part of the society, and also let your kids or your spouse or others not worry about the next knock on the door being that you know part of your family will disappear for 10 plus years. Does Mexican immigration help the U.S. economy? 
It does. Many studies How? show. Well, many studies show that of all the immigrant groups, Mexicans start more uh, businesses than others. So they small businesses are the you know the engine of job growth in our economy, and Mexicans of all these immigrant groups start more. Um, we Mexicans, it shows on average, uh, pay more into the system, whether it's Social Security taxes, sales tax, and the like, than they take out. Um, but what it also shows, other data shows, is that the wave of Mexican immigrants coming to the United States has slowed uh, and is unlikely to ever return to the levels of, say, the 1990s and early 2000s. Well, we don't have as many jobs as we used to have. We don't have as many jobs as we used to have, but Mexico doesn't have as many young Mexicans as it used to have. So you look at what the, is the birth rate? It's, it's, it's decreased in the last the birth uh, rate is now, two decades, hasn't exactly. it? Exactly. You look back the late 70s, early 80s, and Mexican families on average had seven kids. Today, it's just above two kids per family. So the replacement rate, as demographers say, the same as the United States. So you look forward and you look at kids born in 2000 when they're going to come of age at the latter part of our, this decade. There's just fewer of them. In fact, a couple hundred thousand fewer turning 18 each year compared to back at the high point of U.S.-Mexico immigration. So we're seeing a big shift in that. The demographic factor is unlikely to change going forward. Do we need a guest worker program where they come over and work and then go back to Mexico? Should we encourage that? I mean, this is something that should be on the table. And, and one thing we've seen change, in the 1990s, the Mexicans that came to the United States often left. And surveys showed that one out of every two left that same year, and 75% left within two years. So it was what scholars often call circular migration. You come for a few months, you work, and then you go back. And you leave your family at home, and you have ties to your family at home, because half of your life is there. You look today, and less than 10% of Mexicans say they go back each year. So they're really making their life here in the United States. They're not going back to their hometown or to their families With at their home. families. And then if they have kids born here, the kids are American the citizens. Kids, and so they're rooted here even more. And so if you do want to encourage Mexicans to come and work and the labor we may need at various levels of, of, the, of the labor set or the labor scale, um, how to do that, a guest worker program may be an important part of that. And we're not just talking about farm workers picking grapes. We're t in many cases, we're talking about highly skilled um, individuals, aren't we? We are talking about that. In fact, half of the Mexicans who have PhDs are living in the United States. So we have the high end of Mexico as well as some that are working in more manual labor. And what about our visa program? Sometimes we educate them and then they go back to Mexico. So what's the point of educating them here if they're not going to stay in the United States and uh, contribute to our economy? Right. I mean, that's a challenge not just for Mexicans, but for immigrants from all over the United States. As we bring them here, we have some of the best universities in the world, uh, and then they're unable to stay and, and join us. I think Senator Schumer wants to give a green card with a college diploma. Uh, <laughs> I've heard that. Staple it to the stay diploma. <laughs> So that might be a solution. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's all well and good, but shouldn't we secure the border first and uh, maybe build a wall? And, uh, and uh, that'll keep them out, and then we can let the ones in we want to let in, and, uh, mm -hmm. and everything will be fine. Uh, do you support that? You know, it's interesting. You look, another transformation of the last two decades is what we do on the U.S.-Mexico border. And the money that goes down there has more than doubled as have the number of individuals in the Border Patrol. So we have seen a huge inflow of resources and manpower to our southern border. And you look at the results, and those have changed as well. The number of illegal immigrants coming over is down dramatically, um, as is, by some accounts, some of the flow of drugs and other things. So our border, in many ways, is more secure than it's ever been. But the question now is, what do we want and what can we actually do? And, and what are the returns on more and more investment down there? And the other side of this coin goes back to the economics, which is the trade that comes over that border. And we now have over half a trillion dollars worth of goods going back and forth across the U.S.-Mexico border every year. So more than a billion dollars every day is crossing that border. And if you want that trade to continue, which supports millions of U.S. jobs and workers and factories and the likes, ha will you slow that down and that good growth for our economy uh, in building a wall and increasing the enforcement that we see? So there's trade-offs here that we're going to need to make as we think about enforcing the border. Well, the flow of trucks out of the United States 
moves uh, pretty much apace while the trucks coming into the United States uh, stand in long lines at the border while they have security checks, even though uh, they represent known companies. And uh, I mean, what does that do for the whole trade situation? It slows the trade down. And in fact, actually- In fact, it hurts the environment. They're, it they're hurts the environment idling. as well, the diesel mm -hmm. and the other fumes. It's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And it goes both ways. If you're a U.S. company exporting to Mexico, and Mexico is actually our second largest export destination, and we export far more than we do to places like China, for instance, another big trading partner, it's also slowed down. It can take many hours to get across the U.S. border south as well as, as you mentioned, of course, coming north. So this is an issue, and for companies that do just-in-time delivery, that trying to manage their inventories and keep costs down, it can be a real question, a real challenge. Uh, why not just find them, and uh, the illegals that are here, and deport them? I mean, that's, of course, that's an expensive operation, but uh, do you it, advocate that? Well, it's an incredibly expensive operation. In fact, there was one s statistical study done that said, if we really tried to do this, it would cost more than the whole budget of Department of Homeland Security for, for each year for the next five years. So as we go through sequester and, and the like, it's, it's hard to imagine we'd find the money to do that. Um, and two, there are other effects if we thought about deporting these individuals. And so think of the U.S. citizens who are kids who will be left without their parents or spouses who will you know, miss their loved one. There's other challenges here. It's not just an economic decision. And meanwhile, they keep them in solitary confinement, which is very expensive. But Incredible. now I have a question for you. Uh, do you believe there's a road ahead for the U.S.-Mexico relationship? Well, I believe whether you like it or not, there's no choice. The road ahead for both nations is together. No choice. So. Uh, Thank you so much. This has been marvelous. I'm sorry we have to stop here. It's great to be so here. So thank you for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Visit Shannon's website too, latinintelligence.com. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.